DiscerningHearts.com presents Salvation Begins Now, Last Things First with Deacon James Keating. Deacon Keating is a professor of spiritual theology and a spiritual director at Kenrick Lennon Seminary in St. Louis, Missouri. In the past, he has served as the Director of Theological Formation at the Institute for Priestly Formation, located in Omaha, Nebraska. Deacon Keating has conducted over 400 workshops in the areas of morality and spirituality. Deacon Keating is author of numerous books, including The Way of Mystery and Listening for Truth. Salvation Begins Now, Last Things First, with Deacon James Keating. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. Welcome, Deacon Keating. Thank you. Tough subject, hell. Who wants to think about it? Who wants to ponder it? Well, nobody does because it's uh, so real. And because it's so real, uh, we've done a great job of making it disappear. Uh, It's such a painful thought. What's most real is the, the fact that we actually choose hell even as God is continually straining to offer himself to us in love. And that, of course, is the great human drama, and all of us have to think about our place in that drama. Are we, in fact, allowing God to reach us with his grace? And if we are allowing him, are we allowing that grace to go deep enough to sever our affection for our serious sins? Those are the sins that will keep us separated from his love. And so it is a very sad topic, but more and more we have to uh, face it head on. Over the last 50 years, of course, we put it by by the wayside and had this Pollyannish optimistic vision that uh, because God is love, uh, all of us are love too, Uh, but we're not. There's many of us who fail to choose to love, fail to receive love. So we can confuse ourselves with God, and I think we did that for 50 years, and therefore, according at least to the American Catholic imagination, there's nobody in hell, and hell is empty. Who who goes to hell? All of those who die without repenting, uh, without repenting of grave and serious sin. The Church has never changed its teaching on sin uh, regarding uh, the, the changes from the Second Vatican Council, the uh, the Vatican Council, too, did not do anything to our doctrine on hell. And uh, theologians speculate it over the last 50 years, again, influenced by many cultural uh, fonts and by our own brokenness as human beings. Uh, they reflect it, and in their reflections, they led us away from the truth. And the people who go to hell are the people who die in mortal sin. And that has always remained a uh, hard and fast foundation of our understanding of our human relationship with God. We are in charge of our own freedom. And we can uh, choose to allow God to affect us, or we can choose to turn our backs and live a so-called independent life, and in doing so, choosing uh, fantasies and mirages as the meaning of life. And usually those fantasies and mirages revolve around pleasure or expedient choices that help our egos. And if we uh, continue to choose what the church calls grave matter, which are basically the Ten Commandments, we choose to go against the Ten Commandments, uh, if we do it freely and knowingly, we are in a state of mortal sin. And um, if death finds us in that condition, the Church has always taught uh, we have chosen hell. Is it a question of loving those things that we've chosen more than we love God? Because many will say, well, I love God, but I love this too. I don't want to give it up. Right. It's, it's what we choose, and what we choose we become. So again, so brilliantly, through grace and reason, the church teaches, if you're choosing this freely, and if you know that it's a sin, 
and that it's grave matter, it's very serious uh, object that you're choosing. You are becoming what you're choosing, and therefore you are becoming uh, the opposite of someone who is in communion with God. So that's why the church defines hell as basically isolation. Uh, we are isolated from God because all of our choices have solidified our identity as a person isolated from God. And one of the amazing and terrifying aspects of death is that death defines us. It's definitive. There is no changing after death. We are either full with the fullness of God, or we are either empty and full of the self. And after death, it's too late. Now, of course, in the case of venial sin or smaller sins, uh, death uh, is, is uh, purifying the person who dies in venial sin because they haven't cut off their relationship with God through mortal sin. And so there's a purification when one sees the face of God, as we talked about in a previous uh, recording, that one sees the face of God upon death. Those who are not uh, in mortal sin, they are purified by that loving, merciful, just face. And uh, they go into deep relationship with him for all eternity. But for those in mortal sin, death is definitive. There's no second choice. We had all the choices that time has given us as we are alive. What's hell like? I mean, is it a, is it a place? I think we have images. We've talked about that with heaven, but it, what's it like? Well, as someone said, hell is a place, like heaven's a place, but it's not a space. Um, it's mostly uh, positively for heaven. We recall it's a relationship with the Trinity. So hell is the absence of that relationship. We go on in existence. Again, this is the horrific truth. God never takes back a gift that he has given. And our lives are gifts. So there was hopeful and wishful thinking in theological circles in the 1970s uh, that dead mortal sin, uh, dead people who commit mortal sin, uh, well... They'll go out of existence. That's what will happen to them. Uh, but God never takes back his gift. The gift was given. You have life. And God sustains the gift that he gave, your life. Uh, people would like to go out of existence if they've committed horrific acts and don't want to spend eternity alone, where, as the scripture says, they will weep and gnash their teeth. But just fantasizing or wishful thinking is not going to change the truth as revealed by Jesus. Jesus talks about hell a lot in the scriptures. And so hell is a place of emptiness. And the suffering of hell perhaps has to do with the reality of human memory and human choice. That I was given many graces and refused them. And now I have become what I have chosen to become against God. And this uh, horrific reality that our choices create us and that our choices define us for all eternity is certainly not spoken about enough catechetically uh, or homiletically. And so we have a, many generations perhaps now who have never heard uh, these bracing truths. So hell is a, a place and it, it's, it's real. And we choose to go there. To whom much is given, much is expected. I, I can't imagine the, the poor in India having to suffer quite the pangs of hell like those who have been given so much blessing. Well, we, we always remember and go back to those, those teachings of ours that if anything interferes with your freedom or your knowledge, uh, then... The uh, activity that we're involved in is lessened. It used to be called the modifier of the voluntary, that, that your actions are modified by your lack of freedom or your lack of knowledge. And so that which might appear to be mortally sinful 
in different circumstances uh, may not be true because someone is ignorant or someone is not free. And so it could be a case of poverty or it could be a case of poor education. It could be a, a case even of addiction, although perhaps the person would be held accountable for beginning the addiction. But there are these modifiers of the voluntary that, um, if you will, change the course of the meaning of a human action from one that is appears to be definitively against truth to one that is complicated and due to circumstances has not cut the person off from truth or from the face of God. And this gift of life that is irrevocable, this gift goes on and death does not take the gift of life away from uh, God's will. God always willed that you would exist from the moment of your conception until forever. So the, there's a beauty here in the generosity of God wanting to relate to us for all eternity. And we interrupt it by our acts. And in a strange way, God still, in the goodness of his will, relates to us even in hell because we continue in existence. So he relates to us through our being. The tragedy is we can't relate back because we have chosen our entire constitution to be about the self. And there, there's the origin of our hellish sadness that God, by keeping us alive, by having our existence continue after death, is still being God, still loving us. And the great sadness is we can never now return that love. That's what time is for. And when time is done, time has defined us for all eternity. We'll return to Salvation Begins Now, Last Things First, with Deacon James Keating in just a moment. Discerning Hearts provides content dedicated to those on the spiritual journey. To continue production of these podcasts, prayers, and more, go to discerninghearts.com and click the donate link found there or inside the free Discerning Hearts app to make your donation. Thanks and God bless. Litany of Humility O oh Jesus, meek and humble of heart, hear me. From the desire of being esteemed, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being loved, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being extolled, Deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being honored, Deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being praised, Deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being preferred to others, Deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being consulted, Deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being approved, Deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being humiliated, Deliver me, Jesus from the fear of being despised. Deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of suffering rebukes. Deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being calumniated. Deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being forgotten. Deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being ridiculed. Deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being wronged. Deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being suspected. Deliver me, Jesus, that others may be loved more than I, that others may be esteemed more than I, that in the opinion of the world others may increase and I may decrease, that others may be chosen and I set aside, that others may be praised and I unnoticed, that others may be preferred to me in everything, that others may become holier than I, provided that I become as holy as I should. Jesus, grant me the grace to desire it. Amen. Did you know that Discerning Hearts has a free app where you can find all your favorite Discerning Hearts programming? Father Timothy Gallagher, Dr. Anthony Lillis, Monsignor John S. of Deacon James Keating, Father Donald Haggerty, Mike Aquilina, Dr. Matthew Bunsen, and so many more. 
They're all available on the free Discerning Hearts app. Over 3,000 spiritual formation programs and prayers, all available to you with no hidden fees or subscriptions. Did you also know that you can listen to Discerning Hearts programming wherever you download your favorite podcasts, like Apple Podcasts, Google Play, iHeartRadio, Spotify, even on Audible, as well as numerous other worldwide podcast streaming platforms. And did you know that Discerning Hearts also has a YouTube channel? Be sure to check out all these different places where you can find Discerning Hearts Catholic Podcasts, dedicated to those on the spiritual journey. We now return to Salvation Begins Now, Last Things First, with Deacon James Keating. It's the bleakest of the bleak. It, it just, it, there's nothing worse than hell. Uh, the, the term is, it has its own reality in our minds. Why do we not hear more about this? And why is there not a clarion call more often from the one place we would expect it, and that's in our churches? Well, because hell was muted. It was muted by um, seminary professors who taught scripture. And um, there's a new generation of priests coming now, and there's a new uh, fresh look at the theological interpretation of scripture that diminished hell. And uh, I think now we are seeing again. We are seeing again. That's that's what's clear. Uh, Dr. Ralph Martin from Sacred Heart University, Sacred Heart Seminary in Detroit, uh, wrote a beautiful doctoral dissertation and now a book that will be coming out on um, the whole theology present in Scripture that we need Jesus for salvation. Sounds strange that we have to reaffirm this. But we need Jesus to be saved. We are not automatically all going to heaven. We are all born broken. We are all born more easily ordered towards selfishness and sin than toward God. And so if we're left alone in that state, if we have a an optimism that is filled with lies, that all Americans, don't worry, we're all nice people, we're all going to heaven, If we leave our people in that state, we are risking to be opposed to the Jesus that gave clearly his mind in the scriptures. And as I said, if you look closely at the scripture, you will see that Jesus is very clear. In fact, at one point, the scripture says, depart from me, you cursed ones, into eternal fire. I don't think that sentence and other sentences that are revealed from Jesus can be easily written off. And we have a new day and a new understanding of how to appreciate Scripture from John Paul II and from Benedict. And we have a new generation of priests. And so let's hope uh, that with such theologians as Ralph Martin now teaching in seminaries and this new generation of priests, that the days of silence about hell and the days of silence about the necessity of Jesus as a Savior to be personally appropriated by all of us because of our brokenness. We hope that those days are over and we can preach the gospel of hope that nobody does have to go to hell if they would only turn their face toward the face of Christ. Again in the Catechism at 1008, death is the consequence of sin. And essentially, that's what that no is, isn't it? It's that sin and loving something more and desiring something more than authentic and true and lasting love. Yeah, death is the great symbol of uh, sin. And yes, the word no to God is a further symbol of sin. And so the no and death are working in the person who ends up in hell. They have allowed death to work on them. They have allowed their refusal to be loved by God. They have allowed their refusal to suffer the purification that is needed to enter life with the Trinity. 
they have decided to say no to that needed purification. And so their, their whole life is defined by, their whole destiny is defined by death. As opposed to those who are receiving, albeit it is painful to receive the love of Christ. Because Christ's love continually separates us from death and sin. And we have a penchant in us because of original sin, to go to the lower places. It's easier for us to go to the lower places, to go towards sin, to go toward darkness. is much easier for us than it is to rise to light and rise to heaven and rise with Jesus to eternal life. Because to do that, we have first have to go through the purification of desire. We have to stop desiring the immediate and artificial consolation of sin, and we have to begin to desire a life of grace and goodness, which to some extent we, we have um, a repulsion to because of the state we're born in through original sin. And so the Holy Spirit tutors us to choose life and light to choose grace, to choose yes, to rise with Jesus. The Holy Spirit's in us since baptism, tutoring us to go in that direction rather than the direction of death and sin. Because when we choose death and sin, it obviously has consequences. All of our choices have consequences. And the consequence of choosing death and sin is this darkness of separation from God, even throughout eternity. And this, by the way, is the urgency of evangelization. The urgency of evangelization is given to us in the depths of our hearts to call people into the light and away from the darkness. Could it be part of our anxiety over hell is also the fear for loved ones which somewhere in our hearts we feel, oh my goodness, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. And we mollify it and make ourselves feel better by uh, diminishing the reality of the teaching. The, if we are afraid that our relatives are perhaps um, not going in the right direction, then we should intercede for them, do our best to evangelize them, although we all know that evangelizing our own family is very, very difficult. But we present uh, our fears to other intercessors then, our parish priest, friends, other Christians that we have. And we also invite them to evangelize our family members. If we can't get to them, invite the parish priest to get to them or another minister of the church to reach your own family. But our job is to pray for our family members, to fast for them, to sacrifice for them. Now, for those, of course, who have already died and we are afraid that our loved ones may be in hell, we continue, since we do not have the knowledge that God has, we continue to offer masses for them, which, of course, we must uh, reiterate again the necessity that when a relative dies, you should have many masses set for them in your parish. The, uh, the love that flows from the, uh, the Mass, from Jesus himself, purifies and hastens the day for those who are in purgatory to see him face to face in the fullness of his love. So we should once again begin very strongly the uh, powerful practice of having Masses said for our family members. This will also uh, give us some hope because love likes to do things. And this is what love does after someone has died. Love prays for the person. And the Mass is the greatest and the most powerful prayer. So put your fears about your loved ones into the Mass. Any final thoughts? If we continue to evangelize that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and we take seriously our own broken human condition, when we put those two together, our broken condition with the fact and the reality that a Savior has come among us, there is no need to be afraid of hell. For Jesus is spending all eternity 
reaching out to us, consoling us, calling to us, and giving us all the grace we need to say yes to his sacred heart. So do not be afraid. Everything that is necessary for salvation has been given to us in Jesus. Thank you, Deacon Keating. Thank you. You've been listening to Salvation Begins Now, Last Things First with Deacon James Keating. To hear and or to download this episode along with many others, go to discerninghearts.com. This has been a production of discerninghearts.com in cooperation with the Institute for Priestly Formation. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. Join me next time for Salvation Begins Now, Last Things First with Deacon James Keating.